Hi, and welcome to this video on the fundamentals of remote sensing of rangeland vegetation. In this video, we're going to demystify how rangeland vegetation can be measured from space. And in the process, you're going to come away with an understanding of how remote sensing of rangeland vegetation relates to monitoring and management, especially in the context of the rangeland analysis platform. So I welcome you to this video and hope you enjoy the journey. Let's start by defining just what we mean by remote sensing. And well, the term remote sensing can be defined as the science of obtaining information about objects or areas from a distance, typically from aircraft or satellites. And essentially, remote sensing is just another way of measuring rangelands. Most often when we think of rangeland vegetation monitoring, we think of a scene like this photo a team collecting vegetation data using transects on location in the field. Field-based methods are irreplaceable, but they have their own sets of limitations that remote sensing can help to overcome. The field of remote sensing is probably almost as broad as that of field monitoring, and there are a lot of ways to do remote sensing, each with their own strengths and limitations. By now, you're probably actually familiar with a variety of different remote sensing data sets, even if you haven't realized it. And you've likely interacted with different remote sensing instruments. For example, perhaps someone in your office has been using unmanned aerial vehicles to monitor rangeland vegetation. Or you may use products collected by airplanes or satellites. Some remote sensing data that you might use every day are even collected from the Earth's surface. A few examples of products that you may be familiar with are the USDA's National Agricultural Imagery Program, or NAEP, the National Land Cover Dataset, or NLCD, Landfire, and even Google Maps has aspects of remote sensing involved. You also may not have thought of weather radar as remote sensing, but in fact it is. So there are a wide variety of different types of remote sensing. So here we're going to simplify things and focus on one of the most common and useful approaches known as, known as passive remote sensing. Passive remote sensing is kind of the opposite of active remote sensing, which includes methods like LIDAR or sonar that send energy from a sensor towards the Earth's surface. Rather, in passive remote sensing, as our fictitious satellite, which we'll call RangeSense, will demonstrate, relies on the energy from the sun. The energy from the sun moves through the atmosphere and comes into contact with the Earth's surface. At that point, it is either absorbed or reflected, and this energy is ultimately reflected and emitted by the Earth's surface, providing tremendous information about vegetation and a variety of other Earth processes. To understand more about how this reflected energy tells us about plants and how it's measured, we'll need to look closer at the specific types of energy that are be being reflected. And to do that, we'll need to think about the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum. Range Sense measures different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, which each provide different types of information about the environment. As humans, we're most, most familiar with just one part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Our eyes sense visible light in the form of red, green, and blue energy. They help us to see that this prairie landscape is green and healthy. Range Sense, on the other hand, also measures red, green, and blue light, but it goes a little bit further beyond what our eyes are capable of, also measuring portions of the infrared energy as well. By using all of these portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, when RangeSense scans this field, it collects information that tells it that it's different from when it scans, say, this field, which is now in fall with vegetation starting to turn brown for the season. You can think of these satellites as taking pictures of the Earth, but when you do, just remember that they're also capturing all these other types of information, not just the red, green, and blue energy that we're accustomed to as humans. All right. Let's make this all a bit more concrete by looking at a specific satellite program. In fact, 
we'll look at the longest running Earth observation satellite program and perhaps the most widely used, Landsat. Landsat is a joint program operated by the U.S. Geological Survey and NASA, and it's been in operation for nearly 50 years. To date, there have been eight Landsat satellites. Although, Landsat 6 never achieved orbit, and so it didn't collect any data. Darn. These satellites have been in operation since 1972, but Landsat 5, 7, and 8 are often considered the modern Landsat because they are all collected in a similar way. So, the modern era of Landsat has operated continuously from 1984 to present day. If you ever wondered why so many datasets run from 1984 to present day, that's why. And, of course, that's why the Rangeland Analysis Platform datasets are produced for that exact same period. Just like our example from RangeSense earlier, Landsat collects measurements of different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that can tell us about rangeland ecosystems. We all know that a variety of factors affect rangeland vegetation. Well, information from Landsat can tell us about anything from the underlying geology or fire severity to agricultural crops and water and soil moisture, and of course about the vegetation itself. So Landsat, like RangeSense, is measuring all of this information continuously and across the entire globe, not just at this location in Nebraska. So to get an, an idea of the immensity of this program, we're going to have RangeSense introduce us to Landsat in its native environment, out in space. This is Landsat 8, observing the Earth from 438 miles above the surface. Each Landsat satellite collects a complete image of the Earth every 16 days. Right now, we're seeing it collect its first day's worth of images. If it looks like it's flying fast, that's because it is. It's flying at 4.5 miles per second, and it circles the globe every 99 minutes, meaning that it makes 14 orbits every single day. You can see that it collects one swath of observations at a time, which is 115 miles wide, and each swath, each swath overlaps slightly at the edge with the neighboring swath. Landsat is synced with the sun to ensure that it crosses the equator of the sunlit side of the Earth at around 10 a.m. local time. And by the, the end of day 16, Landsat has collected a complete image of the Earth. Within a given year, the Landsat satellite will continue to collect one new complete image of the Earth every 16 days. In total, this results in almost 23 complete images of the planet Earth each year. And as anyone who's worked on western rangelands knows, landscapes change a lot over the period of a year. This landscape in central Wyoming is often snow covered in January, has green vegetation by the end of May, and by October, vegetation has gone dormant. Landsat helps us to understand how rangeland plant communities change throughout the year. And as we've learned, the modern era of Landsat has collected almost 23 images of Earth every year for more than 36 years. Imagine the changes that Landsat has recorded on western rangelands over that period. For starters, it observed the 1989 Yellowstone fire and the subsequent recovery. It observed the lead-up to pine beetle infestations that have affected western forests. And it recorded the 2010 to 2011 drought that impacted much of New Mexico and Texas. Since 1984, it has seen every plant invasion, management action, urban and energy development, and climatic cycle. And it helps us to understand how each of these processes affect rangeland vegetation. Every pixel within a Landsat image is a measurement. And these measurements are recorded for a finite area and a precise location. As we discussed, these images are images, but they're also measurements. Measurements of reflectance from the sun. And each of these measurements are, as I mentioned, for a finite area. 
measuring the area of this pixel shown here, which is 30 meters by 30 meters, which is roughly the size of the infield of a baseball diamond. And remember that each of these measurements are not just a photo, but are taking measurements of all these different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And of course, there have been measurements for this pixel, for example, almost 23 times a year for every year. Each of these factors describes the immensity of the Landsat dataset and can help you to appreciate the power of it in vegetation analysis. It might be helpful to know that over the course of this video, you've actually learned some key remote sensing concepts that have specific terminology. That wasn't the purpose of this video, but it might be helpful to know that the size of the pixel is the spatial resolution and how frequently a satellite takes an image of each location is the temporal resolution. And then how much information the satellite records about the electromagnetic spectrum and how precisely it records it is the radiometric resolution. We also introduced some other key remote sensing concepts. For example, platforms are the type of, well, platform that sensors are mounted to. We discussed the distinction between passive and active sensors and especially focused on passive sensors throughout this video. In particular, we discussed in some depth how passive sensors measure the electromagnetic spectrum. And beyond that, we looked at a passive sensor program, Landsat, which is absolutely essential for long-term rangeland vegetation modeling. Wow, <laughs> we covered a lot of ground in this video, and I really appreciate you joining me for this exploration of the fundamentals of remote sensing of rangeland vegetation. First and foremost, I hope this helps you as you're working with RAP datasets. And I really encourage you to check out our videos on the herbaceous biomass and vegetation cover datasets, which will be linked here right in a minute. I've also linked to, uh, in the description below, a uh, cheat sheet that describes some of these key concepts that we covered in this video uh, that you can refer back to. And be sure and leave any comments in the comment section below. I'm happy to try to respond to any questions, any video requests that would be helpful. And uh, yeah, above all, I thank you for joining me and look forward to uh, seeing, you, seeing you next.